Now we all know Team Fortress 2 is a deep, class-based FPS, but did you know that this game also has a few cosmetic items in it? It's true! Not only that, but there's a frighteningly expansive economy dedicated to trading trilbies and fencing fedoras. So how exactly did Valve get us to care so much about whether or not our engineer could look like a fat Elvis impersonator? These sort of in-game stores don't just materialize out of nothing. Except when they do, and suck. A lot of work goes into making a successful in-game shop. You don't even want to know the sort of bonkers shit you have to pull to create a legit economy. This video is going to tell you everything about how Valve turned virtual fashion into virtual bank. We're going to take you from TF2's first hat right up to the Manco store, because that's really the climax of all this. And because I don't even know where to begin talking about some of this later shit. To first get an idea of how this hat business started, we're going to have to go all the way back to October of 2007, when the game first launched. Originally, the nine classes in the game only had their stock weapons. This meant no backpacks, crafting, trading, or nothing. At the time, you just picked your class and spawned without even considering what you have equipped. All that changed when Valve announced that they would be developing updates focusing on giving a class a new alternative arsenal to play with. Every few months, Valve shipped a major update for TF2. Valve gave new weapons to several classes, but hats didn't enter the equation until TF2's fifth major update in May of 2009, the Sniper vs. Spy update. Now, if you're familiar with the way that Valve announces updates, then you know that they are typically teased for several days prior to dropping. The Sniper vs. Spy update was no exception, and was a pretty exciting ride of surprise reveals and leaked videos. However, the largest surprise was the introduction of the drop system, and yes, hats. But, such a monumental change to TF2 was not heralded with the typical fanfare you'd expect. Valve actually didn't officially announce hats being added until a day after the patch, leaving players to piece together the details of the first nine hats added to the game. Players initially weren't sure what they did or how to get them, but it was apparent from all the buzz that they wanted them. Eventually the details materialized, that these hats were incredibly rare drops from the new drop system, with only a few lucky players fortunate enough to find one of these hats. Most of the time, the drop system would just give the player a random weapon, and most players hunting for hats just ended up with a full backpack of duplicate weapons. There was no trading or crafting system, but there were hush whispers of these systems being added eventually. Valve must have realized they were onto something with these hats, because in August of 2009, TF2 received its first major update not focused on a class, the Classless Update. The star of this update was several new hats that were added to the game. The addition of more possible hats to find seemed like the next logical step, but Valve added a little curveball to the hat business. If you were quick enough, you could follow a secret link on one of the update pages to earn the Gentleman Service Medal. Although a comparatively less showy item than most cosmetics, this item became a coveted collectible due to the fact that it was only given to the first 11,111 people to access the page. Suddenly, there was something rarer than a hat, something that was limited. Anybody could get a hat through dumb luck, but there was now another tier of folks who got their hands on something rarer. People wanted hats, and at this point, they were willing to do just about anything to increase their chances of getting one. Idle servers began springing up where players could just spawn and leave the game running, coming back every so often to check to see what dropped. Some people chose an even easier and less sanctioned solution. A third-party program created by Drunken Fool allowed players to idle without even having to start up TF2. Valve was less than pleased with people using a third-party tool to fiddle with the item drop system, and in September of 2009, Valve removed all items that were earned by using this program. Yes, including hats. Those who weren't tempted to use the idling program were giving a special hat, the Cheater's Lament, for their honesty. Naturally, the honest and rule-abiding lot were shunned by the less honest among them, with popular mods cropping up that would replace the innocent Halo with all sorts of vulgarities. Halloween 2009 started the tradition of TF2's yearly Halloween updates, and introduced one of the most infamous hats in the game, the Ghastly Gibbous. Similar to the Gentleman Service Medal, this item was given away to 10,319 people when they visited a hidden page on the update website. If you play TF2, you know that this item is far from rare though. That's because the Ghastly Gibbous could also be obtained by dominating a player who is wearing one. So now every scrub under the sun has one of these crumble hats on their noggin. These hats were certainly building up a lot of hype for TF2, but what if that sheer hype could be harnessed to hype up another game? Oh, and uh, make an assload of cash, of course. Left 4 Dead 2 was set to release to an uneasy crowd of fans on the PC. Many people were worried about this sequel splitting the community from Left 4 Dead 1, while others were concerned that Valve was cashing in on a quick, shoddy sequel. So in November of 2009, Valve announced that anyone who pre-ordered Left 4 Dead 2 on the PC would get Bill's hat in TF2. 
Now maybe, just maybe, creating a promotion that gives anyone who pre-orders the game a dandy free hat was a way of soothing the PC crowd. And because it was only given away for those who pre-ordered the game, it seems like Valve knew just how big hats were becoming, and that they could be used to sway the decision of a few fans who were on the fence. Bill's hat also has the honorable distinction of being the first hat in TF2's history that needed to be bought. Although technically a freebie, the only way to get your hands on it was to slap down the cash at launch for Left 4 Dead 2. December of 2009 saw the introduction of crafting into TF2 with the war update. By crafting 81 weapons together into increasing qualities of metal, anyone could get their hands on a hat through sheer time and will. Eventually the number of acquired weapons was slashed by a third, but the price remained steep. Even the most fortunate players would still have to play for several dozen hours to get the required materials needed to craft a hat. Valve also ran an art contest with this update, offering three unique variants to three new hats to the winners. Once again, Valve was using the draw of hats to create buzz for TF2. While all this was going on, TF2 had attracted a very active modding community. People were reskinning weapons and hats unofficially for fun before Valve eventually took notice. In March 2010, Valve released the first community contribution update, making three weapons and nine hats that were formerly unofficial downloadable mods into actual items in the game. Valve showed a welcomeness to their community that has led to thousands of pieces of fan content officially making their way into Valve's various franchises. Eventually, we'd see that nearly every current Valve game would have their cosmetics made almost entirely by an eager community of fans. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves with that. Following that was a Sam and Max promotion in April of 2010, allowing players to wield the weapons of the freelance police themselves and wear Max's severed head. This would start a trend of Valve using TF2 to promote other games on Steam, and vice versa. Other companies undoubtedly saw the impact something like Bill's Hat had on the community, and wanted to create similar buzz for their game. We also saw the introduction of badges that were awarded to players based on when they started playing TF2. And after that was the second wave of community contributions, introducing new weapons and hats all created by the community. Anyone who has ever attempted a big ticket trade in TF2 knows what comes next. Earbuds. In June of 2010, these items were awarded to those who played the newly released macOS version of TF2 before a certain date. Originally Valve only gave players four days to get them, but then extended the deadline. This limited window and method of acquirement gave earbuds a unique sort of rarity to them, which caused them to become a popular unit of currency among future traders. July 2010 saw the final class-based update for TF2, rounding out the roster by giving the engineer his well-deserved lot of alternative weapons. But this part of our story focuses on a not-so-new weapon, the Golden Wrench. Although just a skin for the engineer's default wrench, this Australian variant has the ability to turn enemies into solid gold, it was only given away to the 100 players who were lucky enough to have it drop while crafting. Although not a hat, we're going to include this milestone because of the hysteria created. You'll notice a running theme in all this is that Valve always seems to be looking for ways to create rare items and center promotions around them. In the coming years, we'd see a lot more weapon variations in the same vein as the Golden Wrench. Between that and the next major update, Valve released hats promoting both Alien Swarm and Worms Reloaded. The Worms Reloaded hat was a promo similar to Sam and Max, but the Alien Swarm hat was tied to an achievement in the game Alien Swarm. If players completed a full co-op mission in Alien Swarm, they'd find a new hat in their inventory. This was a new method of promoting a game that ensured players would have to try out the game a bit before getting their reward. If you want to know how well this worked out for Alien Swarm, just look at the number of Alien Swarm hats in TF2 versus the number of people still playing it. What happened next was inevitable. Valve had spent just over a year blue-balling a desperate community with constantly escalating hat shenanigans. That fever had reached an epidemic proportion, and players just couldn't scratch that itch with crafting. The Man Economy update was led up to by a contest put out by Valve not to just create weapons and hats, but whole sets for classes. Five winners were chosen out of dozens of submissions, and included in TF2's biggest update to date in September of 2010. More hats, more weapons, and more fucking nonsense than any sensible person could attempt to wrap their head around. Everything Valve learned about hats from this past year was tooled just right for this moment. I mean, where do I even start? Probably the biggest thing to note here is that this is where hats as an economy became something official. Yes, Valve was pushing people towards hats and spending money on methods that would also give you a hat, but you can't have an economy without trading and buying. Players were able to finally trade items between themselves, 
and more importantly was the fact that you were also given the privilege to throw your money at Valve for the hats you so desired. No time promotion, no gathering up items for crafting, just hand over the cash and get exactly what you wanted. In fact, Valve would give you a hat just for buying anything in the store. And remember those sets I was talking about? Well, Valve ran a very dangerous little experiment by giving small buffs to players who had the entire set equipped. This wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for a fact that you needed the associated hat to get the buff. By no coincidence, we see Valve offering players a way to buy hats while offering buff to those dedicated enough to snatch up five more. That's what all this was leading up to, wasn't it? If you didn't think hats mattered before, you couldn't ignore them now. If you were big in the hats, it was all the more reason to get more. Another important feature added in this update to the world of TF2 was the ability to further customize your items. Name tags allowed players to change what a weapon was named, and paint allowed players to customize the color of their cosmetics. These tools allowed players a more detailed sort of personalization, and it also allowed them to sodomize the fucking art style. Now I know what you're thinking. All this sounds nice, but I want some absolutely ludicrous method of getting cosmetics. One that is both insulting to me as a fan of TF2, and as a person with disposable income. Well, good news, because this was the update that introduced crates and keys into TF2. Crates would drop periodically for players, but you would have to purchase a key to open them. At the time, opening a crate would usually net you a weapon, or if you were lucky, a hat. But there was something else you could find. Here's something you'll notice very quickly about Valve. They play their cards pretty close to the chest when it comes to a lot of these things. Most of the time, the full picture of these updates are cobbled together by sketchy forum reports, and no more was that the case than with unusual hats. Valve knows that there's no better way to build up hype, the real uncut primo hype, than to just say something like, oh yeah, there could totally be some kind of exceedingly rare item in that crate. Whenever you hear about a hat in TF2 selling for hundreds, even thousands of dollars, this is why. Those who open a crate were given a minuscule chance of finding an unusual hat, which is a hat that could have one of many additional particle effects buzzing around it. And that will bring us up to speed on the beginning history of hats in TF2. I'd like to end this video with a little analysis of everything you've heard, and pass some advice on for the game designers most assuredly listening in and hanging on my every word. How exactly do you emulate success like TF2 anyway? Well, the biggest point I'd like to make about implementing systems like this is that never have them in your game at launch. I know there's no chance anyone out there who has the power to make these decisions is ever going to turn down money now for the promise of maybe making money later, but trust me, players need to be invested in a game before they're willing to drop some cash on it, and having your big dumb cash shop staring them in the face is the first thing they see puts a bad taste in their mouth. You have to make them want to spend five bucks on a hat, not force them. Another tip is to give players another avenue to get cosmetics than just buying them, even if that system is terrible. Not only does it make everyone feel a little better, but it also doesn't paint everyone with a cosmetic as a chump who slapped down some cash just to show off. Or maybe he just happened to find that expensive set, you know? Another thing is to not announce everything about cosmetics. Leave a little mystery to things. Making the player have to hunt for details about these cosmetics makes them invested in them. Lastly, and most importantly, Roll with what the community wants. If there are threads and websites full of people talking about how awesome a mod is, maybe it's time to go half-seas with the creator of the mod and put it in the game. Or maybe you just shouldn't take any business advice from a guy who still lives with his parents. <laughs>